But if a person were to read to know who God is, then things begin to line up. When things line up like that, when you want to know who your father is, that you may serve him and be what he expects you to be, that's when things line up. That's when all of the motivations from people die away. That's when you're not searching the word of God to be right. You're not searching the word of God to prove anybody wrong. But you're actually looking in the word of God to be a better child of the living God. To find out how you're supposed to live as a new creature in Christ. And in that respect, the Bible comes alive. It really comes to life. It can blow you away. Because you begin to see things that you've always known, but you can never see. The Bible takes on new meaning. It does something to the individual who reads it. There's a spiritual and physical change in doing that. It's like being set free from a bondage you can never see before. It's an absolute gift of freedom. You begin to see your place with the Father as you continue to do this, but it all has to do with motive, why you're reading the Word of God. When you do read the Word of God, what do you do with what you read? I can admit there are times when I read and... and uh, after I read the Bible, my mind or tasks or job would take me somewhere else and I would be instantly involved in something else, forgetting about what I read, not applying what the Lord had given me that day. And, it, you know, right now, looking in hindsight, everybody can look in hindsight and say, you know, I wish I would have changed this. I wouldn't change a thing in my life but this one thing. I wish I would have applied the Word of God every time God gave me understanding that I would change. I would not change the trouble. I wouldn't change the horror that's been in my life. I wouldn't change any of that because all that trouble yields experience. That's why I really have no fear of anything now because of what I've been through. So I wouldn't change that. I wouldn't change the bad people in my life and the good people in my life. I wouldn't have that change either. Things that have happened to me, I wouldn't have that changed. I wouldn't want to change that. I don't want anything changed because God has choreographed our lives in a very specific way. And the smallest alteration in our lives would yield just, just enormous, an enormous change. So I'm appreciative of everything that's ever happened in my life. There's nothing in my life I can curse, nothing. And my life has probably been worse than, than a lot of people's. I consider myself blessed because of what the Lord has had yielded in me due to my life. The life you live is not in vain either. And the more you've gone through, the closer the Lord has been to you. Do you guys know that? If a person does not go through much, I can assure you their experience is going to be little. But if a person has gone through a lot, they're going to have a great intimacy with the living God. Once it really clicks in their minds, if their life has been orchestrated, choreographed, for specific results of the Creator, not because He's punishing anybody, but because He loves you. You have a role in the kingdom. And we don't know who we are in the kingdom yet. The Lord made that clear. We have no idea who we are in the kingdom. We have no idea what our name truly is. The Lord made these things clear. In other words, we don't know what our identity will be in the kingdom. We don't know what that is. Right now, you're living a life with a collection of earthly memories and experiences. And that's who you think you are. But it's not who you are. The Lord never said that we would know all the mysteries of prophecy. That's not what he said. But he does require us to know what season we're in. Matter of fact, he was moved greatly in a not so good direction when the people of his time did not know what season they were in. And the reason they didn't know is because they lost their spiritual sight. They had become rocks, all of them did. So let time have a word. That's just like uh, these kingdoms rising and falling in the end times of old. You guys understand this. You know, sometimes we speak these double statements. So let's start exposing them, shall we? These are tactics of Satan himself. Many people pride themselves on the history they think they know. They will read something and absolutely believe what they're reading. It's the funniest thing. They'll read something about history. If the presentation is good, they'll believe it. Until somebody throws a monkey wrench into the plan, and then half the history you think you know is a lie is based in a lie. It's not real. Things have been altered and changed. Like the locations of nations. Like the borders of nations. Like some of these old maps that show border lines do not match the actual maps that were drawn up so long ago. Something has changed. How can one country be on the opposite side of the earth in the days of old, yet... To match the paradigm of history, all these things today seem to be, you know, presented to people in this fashion where people just trust it blindly. You don't even know if the people you think you know about were real historical figures because everybody who were eyewitnesses of the real history are dead. They're dead and gone. We could be living a life of a lie right now. See, that just messes everything up, doesn't it? Which is why I stay close to the Word of God, to the Bible. Which is why I trust the Spirit 
And I will never be fooled by paper. I know the dirty tricks they can pull. And half of a person's life is lived by a lie. And the knowledge they think they have is laughable. There is a spirit at work that Jesus warned us about. And this spirit seeks to keep people bound. When a person is bound, it's almost like they are programmed to respond in specific ways, to do things. But when you're outside of that programming and you don't respond, like previous dictates and, and all these plans uh, prescribe or program you to do, you become an enemy, right? Hated. And the, the people don't understand why they hate, they just hate. When people point fingers, when they're always pointing fingers at someone, they stoke a fire, the Bible talks about. And in that fire, see, the Lord, in the Bible it says, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So by principles of the word of God, I got rid of the sources of it, and there was the fix. It also says where wood is, there the fire goeth out, right? Where no wood is, the fire goes out. So where there is no tail bear, the strife ceaseth. Now, that was the second stage. Number one, the ones who scorn other folks, they had to go. And the ones who would carry stories about somebody else, they had to go. And we don't deal with the strife. It is effectively suppressed. Do you guys see how these principles work? Now, this is application of the word in a real world scenario. And I love the word of God because God's knowledge is awesome. It really is. It's awesome. Isn't that funny, though? He just, he just left. Right. Then it gives a description. It says, he that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. In other words, they'll prosper. But the one who is proud in his heart, the one who thinks they're right, they had to go to all elements, the roots of strife itself. They had to go from the chapter because the more the more that mindset was permitted, the more the worse the chat room got. And as soon as those elements were gone, that's, it's not the person. I never blame the person. See, a person goes through various stages in life. And when they're going through various stages in life, they're prone to specific things. I, I see it over and over and over and over again. They don't necessarily know what they're doing. They're just being themselves. They may wake up and have a bad day and they're defensive because of their environment at home. So I'm very understanding of that. But to eliminate the sources of these, according to the principles of the living God, they, it never fails. It works in the family unit, big time. It works with everything you do. And it always works. In my life, whenever I get this spiritual nudge or something is wrong with one of the... First of all, if the world embraces it, I will push it away. Because the world will not embrace the word of God. God said so. So why would I embrace something that the world so readily accepts? I'm not going to do it. If the world accepts something like that, I'm pushing it away. I'm not going to receive it. I'm going to have to go look at it much deeper than the average. I'm just not going to receive it. Because the Lord's principle and his word has never failed. It won't fail. It is the truth in my life. It governs many things, in my, all things in my life. And so when the world readily adopts a statement, I have an issue with it. If I see the world running in one direction, I'm going the opposite direction. I certainly will not follow the world. Because Jesus told us that the world stands against his word, his truth, his way. If the world is not going his way, I'm certainly not going the world's way. People constitute the world. The average person out there, carnal, if that root word carnal does not mean evil. That was in uh, almost a modern day Greek thing. That, that's not, it, that, not even the Grecians um, put it that way. Carnal means your natural, your flesh, or your first. Carnal. It's based in the physical realm. So your carnal mind in the Bible, it says your carnal mind is enmity against God. Your carnal mind is against God. Your carnal mind hates God. So all your concepts and all the ways we naturally have that are of flesh are against God that are of your, you know, your carnal mind. And all things go with your carnal mind. So how do you determine what's carnal and what's not? If your brain was taken out, who would you be then? Back to declarations. A declaration is not simply something you state out of your mouth. To understand what I'm saying, you have to know about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is to stand against something in oneself. Let's, let's think of it that way. If I were to say, you guys, you love your enemy, but I go and behead my enemy, I'm a hypocrite. Because I'm saying one thing, but I'm living a life opposite of what I'm saying. I'm teaching one principle, and then by speech you think I follow that principle, but I'm living a different way. That's a hypocrite. And hypocrites go with there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. If I were to pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you for my healing. But then five minutes later, I say, well, you know, I'm sick as a dog and this thing is going to kill me if I don't get medication. I just totally voided my prayer, spoke as a hypocrite. So I'm speaking by prayer with my voice one way. 
But in the truth of my life, I'm standing against my own prayer, having no belief in the things which I said. That's hypocrisy. If you declare something, if you make a declaration by your mouth, that means nothing unless you are behind it, unless you have faith in that declaration. And if you have faith in that declaration, you'll never speak against it. If you were to bind all the negative spirits in your house, and you made a declaration that no darkness is going to operate in your household, you must believe what you're saying. Because if you don't believe in what you're saying, you're just making noise. And your declaration, because you stand against it, is hypocrisy. Now, when you agree with what you're saying, when you start speaking in unity, when you actually believe something, it's already declared. When you speak it, for all those who have ears, they can hear that declaration. But you've already declared it before you spoke it. Well before you spoke it. Your soul has a voice. You know in the Bible when it says that a person will let out moans and groans, that there's a spiritual language that's meant just for the living God to understand, and nobody else will, but God understands spirit to spirit. You begin to commune with the Lord, but outside nobody understands a word you're saying, right? Because when you cry out for something, you're making a declaration. That's where change comes from, by the way. Not necessarily by what you say, but what you cried out for from the soul. Have you ever noticed that when you desperately need to change a situation, everything in your life begins to change? At first, you put a method forward that you heard from somebody else, but then you break down to the time when you stop saying words at all. You don't formulate words anymore. You're not working off some formula, but you cry out from the soul. It may come in the form of tears, but it's of a genuine heart. And I'm telling you, that's when things in your life begin to change. When you observe your own trouble, you'll see that in motion. Once the hip Democracy stops, then your declaration is made plain. And all too often, your declaration is without words. Your declaration comes by way of a deep yearning inside of your spirit with many tears. No words are coming out of your mouth, but your declaration is clear. And I'm telling you, that's when things begin to change. Why? Because you align everything about you in that one direction. Many even perceive a type of power working at that moment. That's your true declaration. It's kind of like a dream. In a dream, you can rebuke things, but you're not using words. You're dreaming. You're not using words. Your voice, that's for somebody else. We wouldn't have voices if we could read each other's minds. There'd be no need for a voice. People make up clever things for a voice, but God made it clear why we have a voice. Why we have ears. He made that clear. See, based on our faith, we receive or don't receive. If all of us were deaf, how could we receive confirmation of something somebody else was given if we don't have ears or eyes? We wouldn't be able to hear or see somebody else's story saying, hey, that's me too. It is for real. We couldn't confirm anything. So he gave that for us. But when it comes to the Most High, is he not a discerner of your thoughts and of your heart? Yes, he is. So he understands what you're saying from your heart of the depth of you. And if it does not match with what comes out of your mouth, that's called hypocrisy. How many get tired of prayers that just don't happen? See, I, 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 listen, there are a lot of people out there that say, well, if I don't get it, it's because God doesn't want me to have it. Or if this doesn't happen, that that's just because, you know, the Lord is just doing this. That No, 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 no. no. We can't compensate like that when we pray according to the word and the Lord said we can have it. We can't sit up there and say, well, maybe he didn't want me to have it right now because he's already given it. Think of it this way. He's laid out all of our blessings right over our heads. But the only way those blessings will come down to us is by faith. It's a faith door you have to open up and it falls on you. But if that faith door does not open, that blessing is hovering. It's yours. Nobody can take it. It's hovering over your head. But because your faith door is not opening, it's just going to stay right there until your faith door opens. A lot of people are like that. I hear people too many times say, well, I've tried to wait on the Lord. What do you mean? How do you try to wait on something? You're either waiting or you're not. But you don't try to wait because if you try to wait, that means you stop waiting. You guys see how that works? How would you ever say, well, I tried to wait upon the Lord. How does that work? I tried to wait. That, that makes no sense. You either wait or you don't. Because when you say, well, I tried to wait, that means you stopped waiting. No one should ever, ever say, I tried to wait upon the Lord. They should say, I'm waiting upon the Lord. Not, I tried to wait, because that means you stopped. Now you're telling somebody that you no longer believe in the method of the living God, that his method is what he says it is. And then your life, you tend to leave, uh, live your life with all this doubt. And then you start searching for formulas. Well, let me find the right formula, the right incantation to get rid of this spirit and that spirit. That, see, to me, I've been in the face of it. I've been thrust into it. And I found that a lot of it 
is for show. Satan is tricking so many people. All Satan has to do in these days to trick a person is for a person to come up with some gibberish. The demon cooperate with some of the darkness working inside the person or some of the gullibleness working inside the person. That demon go away for a while, not make any noise, and everybody thinks the demon is gone. Then everybody else starts to use that formula, and then a day comes called the day of manifestation, when all the demons manifest in their true form, and people start using that formula, and the demons start laughing at them, because it does not work, and it never worked. That's what's happening now. Demons are not going away. They've agreed to be silent for a time, and in the day they manifest, when anybody tries to rebuke them, it's not going to work, because they trusted in a formula, not in the Lord. Because men are slowly being empowered themselves without the Lord by way of their formulas, incantations, their methodology, and everything else. And that's not the way it works. And they're going to find that out painfully. And that just so happens to be in all the older writings that a lot of people don't like. Like the Book of Enoch. Like Esdras. It happens to be in those books. And people don't like those books. Oh, don't put those books back because they expose what's happening right now. Those books warn people to trust in Christ Jesus above all things and do not lean unto your own understanding. Somebody says, uh, from memory, a question from Michael, since I'm not able to chant Esther's 5 8 revelation about the sick seal and animals and beasts from the pale horse death, let me ask you guys a question. You ready for this? How many of you want your pets to go to heaven? I know I sound sarcastic in my voice, right? I know that. I know you don't want to answer, but I already know you do want your pets to go to heaven. I already know that. You know why? Because you love your pets. And when you love something, of course you want it to go to heaven. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, your pets are certainly going to heaven. Let, let me explain something to you guys. If Jesus told all those people that when they go to heaven, they're not going to be male or female. Listen to me. You're not going to be male. You're not going to be female. There will be no need for male or female. You're going to be like the angels being neither male nor female. That's what Jesus said. That means you're not going to be up there like Hercules, and you won't be up there like a little princess from Disney World. You're going to be something you cannot conceive of yet. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that your mind does not hold nor can it grasp what you're about to become. You only know that you're about to be like Christ. You don't yet know what you shall be. But you'll be like him. And Jesus told those people because one, they said, well, you know, what if you had five wives? Which one is going to be a wife in heaven? And Jesus said, don't you know anything? Don't you know you're going to be neither male nor female? You're going to be like the angels. Also something else. All the memories that you have here, all everything you know here, it's in your brain. When a person has dementia or Alzheimer's, all of a sudden they start forgetting events and things that happened in the world. They can't remember. So it's housed in their what? Their brain. When you're absent this body, what will you truly know? Your connections that you have right now won't be there. You're going to see all things in a truthful manner. Now, all things have a spirit, correct? In fact, everything that God made that has life, everything that carries life, even a plant, everything that carries life has an essence of the Father in it. And all things will be one with the Father in the end. And what I'm telling you is don't think in terms of an individual pet. But the animal that was so loyal, the animal that you have that connection with, the animal that never betrayed you, that animal that you love, the bond is love itself. That's what you should identify. And that love is what you're truly after. Because the animal can change form, but will you still love it as the same little puppy trying to get you to see something? Those of you who love an animal, what will it be after it passes from its flesh? Will it have the same form? Will all of them be brand new and look alike? So what are we to identify here? Most people are saying, I want my animal to go to heaven. But the truth is, it's that love expressed that you express to that animal. You see that animal reciprocate that love by not defying your love towards it. Can't you see what's happening? Your love towards that animal is what you're seeing. That love is never challenged, is it? All you people who love animals, God is giving you a great gift to see something. I'm wondering, can you see it? When you love that animal, you know that feeling you get? That light that you see? Can't you see? It's the love flowing through you towards that animal that's unchallenged and you actually get to see it. You think it's the animal. No, you're seeing love itself. And you love that animal. You'll never be without those things that you truly loved like that. Do you know that? Because in truth, it does not matter the form or anything else. Love is always identifiable. You'll never be without that animal. That spirit is bound up in love. You may not necessarily have the bird. You may not necessarily have the puppy. 
But isn't it the love? Isn't that your true identification? You'll never be without that. Can't you see that? That's love going out of you, consolidated, never rejected, because people can reject your love. You start out by giving love like that to people and they reject it. And every single time that love is rejected, you perceive that rejection and you take that, you won't give that love out anymore. If somebody were to allow that love to assemble itself right in front of you, beautiful things would happen. But in most cases, people do bad and evil things. Sometimes they push it away. Not that they mean to, because love is that water. And when you put your love out to something that will not send that love back, or you put your water out to something that will not give that water back, you'll say, well, that's broken. I'm not fooling around with that. But if everybody does that, then you're going to have an eternally broken spigot. People are like that because you go to people and sometimes they didn't hear you. Sometimes they can't comprehend. Sometimes they don't understand. Sometimes they're grumpy. Sometimes they're mean. Sometimes they're hurt themselves. So what? They don't reciprocate your love. That doesn't mean you turn away. That means they're a broken spigot. They don't know how to pour out. But the animal does pour out, doesn't it? You give your love to an animal. Tails wag. Happy faces come. And they reciprocate your love. And you recognize that reciprocation. People are the same way, except they're much more complicated. The same love you feel toward that animal, you can also feel toward all men. You can feel that same love toward all men, regardless if they give that love back or not, is what I want you to say. When a person is put back in the rightful position, they'll always pour water out. The spigots are no longer broken. And that same relationship you have with that animal, that same love you feel, that same non-betrayal thing that you feel, you can have with people. Why do you think the Lord keeps sending you to broken spigots? So many people say, you know, all these people are nuts. So many people, they, they just, they're just hateful. No, the Lord is sending you to the ones who are broken. And you're trying to be sent to the ones that work. He's sending you to the broken ones because they need to be fixed. That was the other part of the dream. Because I saw a field of the, that same setup. A bunch of these big, huge water tanks with an endless amount of spigots on these water tanks. And everybody was walking away from them. We're meant to help prepare those things to prepare them to pour water. Because one day, all of them will fill up everything with unending, crystal clear water. All of them will pour one day. They're broken now, but all of them will pour one day. And it's because somebody labored to fix them. That was the way the Lord showed me something about love. Love that's very real and true. Because who among us would put any animal before God's greatest creation? You know what that is in my heart? That is incredibly foul to me. That anybody would put anything before a human being. And the reason why is because man is God's greatest creation. Man is the apple of God's eye. Man is made in the image and likeness of the creator. But who would forego their flesh heart to help mankind? Because that's what it takes. Haven't you seen this? The only way to truly do the work in the field. See, people want to go to the ones who are not broken. But in the field, there's a harvest. In order to work in that place of the harvest, we have to forego our own hearts. We're too stuck on ourselves. Our own hearts become a shield, doesn't it? It stops us from doing the Lord's work. What did the Lord suffer to have us saved? I can't help but to think about that. I'll tell you guys something. I know what the Lord suffered by reading his word. I know what he suffered, a portion of it. I don't know the whole thing. And if he called me to do the exact same thing, then it's up to me to see if it's worth it or not. And that's my true answer to him. And guess what? It is worth it. That's why he asked Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know I love you. Then feed my sheep. You can't feed a sheep if you turn your back on them. I'm not one who's going to turn my back on them. They're broken. And in this world, in these days, we've gotten into this bad habit of condemning the broken and let's go find the ones who are repaired. When everybody was first saved, we thought it was possible for anybody to be saved. You guys remember that? Because you truly considered, man, if the Lord can save me, he can save anybody. And there was no one you wouldn't go to with your story. You know what that's called? That's your true first love. When you believed without restraint when you believed and then the more you followed God the more pain you perceived the more things happen and you begin to doubt and many you begin to listen to tons of different people and they would give you both horror stories and good stories and you had to pick and choose which ones you were going to believe and you did the hopping around to the right person who was speaking the right thing and you condemned this one and loved the other see all of us did this but at first when we were first saved we had all faith for all people. We said, if God can save me, he can save everybody. So what happened? What made us not believe that anymore? Satan did. Because nobody told us about the process. Nobody stressed the process. That your faith must be qualified. That you're going to be tried. You're going right into the fire. 
all the impurities are going to be burnt out. Nobody told us about that. They didn't tell us what that meant. And so when it happened, we thought it strange. We did the opposite of what the scripture says. The scripture says, don't think it's strange. When we go into those fiery trials, we're not supposed to think that's strange. We're supposed to have knowledge of that. But no one told us that, did we? Until you read it, consider it. See me, I believe it. And because I believe it, it began to work. The Lord began to work without my own internal resistance. Because I found that I was resisting the Lord a lot. That wasn't going to do. And those were the days when I started losing people. When you go with what Jesus said. Not, not the bad people now. You start losing what you thought were the good people. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. It'd be some if you lost all the bad people in your life. That's not what happened. All the people you thought were good and wholesome, poof, they ran away. And the people that you thought were not so good folks, you found out they were totally different. In order for a person to suffer and to be corrected, the Lord's love for that person must be great. Because it changes a person and how they see things. Sometimes we're of such stubbornness that we have to have entire layers of ourselves removed, and that's quite painful. The Lord has to prove us wrong. That's the pain we have in our lives when we're proven wrong. Some people are so stiff-necked, but that's what it's going to take to get them to surrender in full, then so be it. Because the Lord loves you, and He desires to save your soul, which will exist for an eternity. And if it takes you losing everything in your life to save your soul, that's the way it's going to be. People determine that. They can either surrender or they can resist it at all turns. But he does what he does because he loves. If you were condemned, your life will be peaches and cream. But if you're not condemned in his eyes yet, he's going to purge all of what would keep you from him. And he's not playing around about it. And those days are about to be amplified. Somebody says, Michael, will we have to take the mark in order to be a part of the new system? You will. There are so many people that will be prosperous by the system. I hope you don't think this is a joke, but there are going to be so many people who just turn rich overnight that they're going to give money away. There's going to be a lot of rich people and they're going to change uh, the surface of the earth and the whole financial system will eventually change to that platform that cryptocurrency is on right now. It's on it right now, but the, the entirety of the world currency is going to turn to it. Dubai, they're going to really start to uh, change the rest of their systems over to it. They're 50% there. So a lot of people are set up for cryptocurrency right now. Banks are. Certainly our banks give out rewards of cryptocurrency right now. So it's not going anywhere and it's just beginning. Because of that, the system will change. But when they lock it under a citizenship, when you have to become a citizen of a new type of uh, nation, right? we're not talking about a nation with borders. We're talking about a nation by way of values. It's what's happening. It's sweeping everything. To become a part of that, you're going to have to take the oath of citizenship. And of course, in every single oath is a denouncement. To denounce the sovereignty is that you are no longer under that means your faith will not govern your activities in this new nation. If you're one of those people, you're not going to be a part of it. So you're going to have to denounce every single religion, every single one except one. This new religion that's coming out, which everything goes. Why? Can't you see it right now? They don't like people who are homophobic. You can be racist, but you can't be homophobic. They don't like folks who are this, and they don't like folks who are that, and all this other stuff. You can't be it. They don't like folks who think that you can get to heaven or would promote the idea that you can get to heaven only through Christ. They don't like that. They don't like Muslims. They don't like that either. They don't like anybody saying that there's only one way to heaven because they say that limits a person's uh, idea of faith. Faith nowadays is not so much, it's not important to individuals in these days. It really isn't because man has become his own God uh, yet again. And while man believes in science, I I've noticed even in the church, a person can say something by the spirit, but if scientists come out and say the opposite, they'll believe the scientist over anybody who would say something of the spirit. Do you think something is wrong with that? Yes. People don't have faith in those things of the spirit and they need evidence and they believe in evidence and proof. And so they go with the ones who can provide evidence and proof. It's just a point of contention people can argue over and they love the fact that they have information and stuff and all this that, and the other and they don't realize what's really happening. A long time ago, they had it right. Some Somebody said a long time ago, hey, guys, they have put stuff in the food. Nobody paid attention to that. Why? Because nobody was interested in exchange, in, in, in changing any of that. Now they're talking about vaccines. I'll tell you right now, more of the toxins that you consume are in the atmosphere. How are you going to get away from that? Cancer is high for a reason. It's because of the atmosphere. And what they did to the atmosphere to try and cover up other things. It's just dangerous. But it's God's mercy and grace through our own ignorance. He sustains us. But what they've done to the atmosphere is just devastating things. They have um, modified just about every plant on the face of the earth. You can't escape that. If rain falls on something, it's going to be changed. 
period. People go to the store and they buy food from companies they know nothing about. They eat the bread, drink the milk. They don't know what's been put in that stuff. How many have been distracted like you're reading the Bible and then something frustrates you? And so you have to stop reading the Bible to take care of what frustrated you and then you go back to the word of the Lord. How many have done that? In other words, you stop reading because you were frustrated by something else. All of us do that. How many are offended in these days? How many times have you heard something and you have to turn it off because you start getting angry? Lots of people do that. How many people can watch CNN? A lot of people cannot. How many can watch Fox? A lot of people cannot. Why? Because you get annoyed. That's a telltale sign you're not ready. You'll be ready when you can watch anything you're not moved. You're not ready if you can still be moved. Listen to me carefully. If you can be moved by way of the news, Satan has a button on you. And when you think you have made it to a certain height, all he has to do is press that button and there you go tumbling. You show your weakness every time. You have to turn away from something. You're not able to take it. There's a weakness in you that Satan can use against you. And for anybody out there, Satan can cause you to hate another person. He's really got you by no means ready for what's about to happen. Because if something external can cause you to hate something, what will proof do? And he will present to many a lie. Somebody could present a truth to me about any of you. It will not change my level of care for you. It has no power to do that. Somebody could tell me of your horrific past. It will not change my heart towards you right now in this moment. He has no power over me in that area. He can never make me target you. He's lost the power to do that. His only next step is to work through those I truly do care about. He cannot get to me anymore. It wasn't always like that, but it is now. But if he can get to you through a person, what do you think he can do through one of his closer manifestations? There are some things we have to overcome in it. These are soft points we're not supposed to have. Jesus told us to get rid of them, but we continue to refuse them, don't we? By keeping these ways that we have. I heard a person say, well, that's just the way I am. And I'll never change for you. You're corrupting yourself. If you have that attitude towards your own life, you're not letting the Messiah in to finish what he began. We are the interrupters. We slow our own progress by resisting his truth. His truth is not what I say. His truth is in the word of God. I'm not the author of his truth. Jesus is the author of his truth. So I don't have the points for you to get all your life together, but Jesus does. And if we resist him by keeping our ways, then we will be spanked with many stripes if he loves us. Has he not sent Jesus trial after trial after trial to expose our weaknesses? And how long will we say, no, take them away? I don't want to get stronger. How many times are we going to say, no, send this problem away? I don't want to overcome this. I don't want to overcome that. Because that's what we're doing. Who do you think sends your trials in the first place? The devil has no power to do anything unless Jesus says, go ahead. And the only time he would do that is to fulfill his word on your life. But we resist him. So we stay where we are in our weakened state, just like Israel did. You know, at the beginning of COT, we had a talk about Israel, about how people came to them and weakened them by giving them these little soft words. Oh, it's going to get better. And God's going to take care of you no matter what. No, God gave them a mandate. God said, purge yourself. Stop walking around with wounds, he said. You should have healed yourself. You should have put balm on it as an act of faith that it may be finished in my healing. But they didn't do that. They walked around with a wounded head, scars and wounds. They wore as badges. People came to them. They said, don't prophesy to us the truth. Give us the good stuff. And they stayed in their weakened state. So God gave a decree for Israel as Jesus also gave to us. See, Jesus told us something. And it's going to happen just like he gave it. It's not going to be in the favor of our flesh. It will be in the favor of eternal life. But listen, you can say no to the Messiah. And you can be blotted out of the book of life. Because all those who continue in their own ways will be given over to a reprobate mind. That's what Jesus said. That's what he gave the apostles. If a person continues and they continue to keep their stuff and refuse correction, God will give you over to sin and you'll be lost and blotted out. That's why Paul said, that the day that everybody's looking forward with the Antichrist, that day is not going to come. The day that we're called up to Christ, that day is not going to come. Let's just come a falling way first. And in condition to, in conjunction with that man of perdition, we revealed. And we know exactly what we resist, don't we? It's no mystery to us. We know what we resist. It's up to each and every individual. Because you know the truth of what you resist and you know the truth of what you don't resist. Only you know that nobody else does. So nobody else can be a gauge on your salvation. Not one soul. Because the Lord already knows. 
So nobody can jump up and say, well, no matter what anybody says, I'm going to be this. There's no need to say that. Nobody can ever say, well, you're just going to be condemned if you don't change. I can't say that either because they don't know what's going on on the inside. And the Lord does. But listen to me carefully. We already know what we resist. We know what we have said. No, Lord, I'm not going to change this. We have actually said that. I'm not going to change that, Lord. I'm going to just, we dodge it, throw it away, move over here, move over there. If the Lord loves us, he's going to get us. He's going to whoop us. We're going to be whooped because he loves us. And if he wants you to make it, get ready for your conditions to totally fall apart if you're rebellious like that on the inside. Because we know. He knows what we, he's given us power to change, is what I'm telling you. If God gave us power to change something and we don't change it, who's accountable? Israel was accountable. And all the men who had worn their hearts had to die and could not enter into the promised land. God got rid of an entire generation. Those who say, I'm going to remain the same way for the rest of my life are denying the change Christ promised all. So who would do that? You see how we are? We know that on an intimate level. And part of your preparation for these end times is that. Because within ourselves, we cannot be prepared for what's coming. Only Christ in us will give us the proper preparations for what's coming. Only with Christ in us will we be able to stand in the first place. By your own power, you can forget it. And again, nobody can be the gauge of that. So I cannot look at you and say, you don't have enough of Christ. And you can't look at me and say that. Only the Lord knows. But before all men, the lie of us will be shown. After a while, when mankind is introduced to things that they don't believe exists, it's going to raise a horror in their hearts to a very high level. People will not think the same. People will become, if you think people are paranoid now, you just wait. That within itself will cause a massive destabilization. Experts who have put people in these conditions. They've seen how military operatives react to seeing the truth, and it's not good. There's never been a case when it was good. In the Bible, the Lord tells us that the world will see it. For the first time, the world's going to see some things. And when they see it, the Lord warns us, it's not going to be for their good favor. No, no. See, we have Christ who can comfort us. Unlike when you saw that frightening movie or heard that frightening story when you were young and you were stuck by yourself and were frightened to go to sleep, you're going to have the comforter with you. So if you hear something horrific or, or if you learn of something that's not supposed to exist that is horrific, the comforter will take that from a high notch to a no notch, right? It's not going to move you at all. It's a big difference in learning something by yourself and then having the Lord be your Lord and Savior and learning something then it's a big difference. To learn something by yourself outside of a relationship with Christ is almost like suicide when you start learning certain things. But with the Lord, if your confidence be in Him, you won't be moved. It's not going to bother you because He will compensate for any heaviness that you could ever have. But I say again, the whole world is going to be introduced into this. And from that moment on, everything will go upside down. Everything is going to be upside down from that time forward. Nothing is going to be the same. People's cares are going to change. Many will disregard human life, period. It's just going to be different. And me personally, how can a person be ready for those things at all? Unless they've been preparing by having their foundation unshakable in Christ. If your relationship with Christ is unshakable, you'll depend upon him. And I'll tell you something, during those times when you cannot be comforted by human flesh, by the presence of another, your relationship with Christ is going to mean everything. I'm telling you right now, utilize every situation the Lord sends your way to operate within the word. Do that in every small thing. Do that in every large thing. Because the Lord will send you these tiny events. And if you notice in your life, every single tiny event he's ever sent you, you have experienced in a bigger way later on. But he gave you practice first. He showed you that it was coming. So with everything that comes your way, these trials and these tribulations, don't push them away. Say, okay, Lord, I'm available. What do I need to do? Learn how to take instruction. Listen, because there's nothing better than to be delivered from a trial or tribulation. And you sit and you say, I listened this time. I didn't push it away. I did what was right. I didn't take the shortcut. I did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And then he delivered me just like he said he would. And he, he normally does this after you obey him. It looks like it's about to blow up in your face. Then when he gets to the very end of it, he delivers you. It's always surprising. When you do that in a small way, you'll do it in a larger way. But the Lord is true in his words. And he said, how can he trust you in a bigger matter? I'm paraphrasing. If you will, you know, if you, we keep bailing out of the small matters. It's like a person, people say, well, if I get a lot of money, I'm going to bless so-and-so. Yeah, but what are you doing with the $1 in your pocket? 
See, most people have this philosophy. It's not enough, so I can't bless them. So let me go ahead and get this for myself. That's not it. If you're going to be a blessing to somebody, then be a blessing where you are. You got to learn to start where you are with what you have. Don't ever wait until you have something that because that just never comes. With what you have and where you are, utilize what you have for the sake of the kingdom. Somebody says, what does he mean we're going to be vessels? That means to be a vessel is this. They're vessels of honor and dishonor. It's written in the Bible. That means everybody's used for something. In the Bible, it says it's not in a man to take a step on his own. Now, this is a big one. You know what that means? Everything you do is influenced by light or by darkness. You're agreeing with one of two kingdoms with everything you do. So your steps are already walked out. But you're in agreement with something for everything you do. To be a vessel is to realize. To be a vessel for the Lord is to be used of the Lord, to house those things of the Lord. To be a vessel of darkness is the opposite. Like when a person gets mean or this, that, and the other. There you go. That's what a vessel is. Who are you allowing to use you? Who are you in agreement with? Because if you agree with your negative stuff, well, then there you are. And if you agree with the things of holiness and light, you're a vessel of good. That's a vessel. But don't ever think that somehow you're doing something on your own. God did not make us that way. People pridefully think they're doing something on their own. Nope, they're being influenced by one kingdom or the next. And everything they do is in line. And just like this, if you agree to murder somebody, you just agree with Satan himself to do that. You will come into an agreement with every action you commit. The question is, what kingdom are you in agreement with, with everything you do and everything you say? That's why we are told to take captive our thoughts. That's why we cast down imaginations and all those things that will exalt themselves above God in our lives. Because it comes into our minds first, and then we either uh, agree with it or we don't agree. Some thoughts you kick out, some thoughts you agree with. Whatever sinks down into your heart and turns into action is the side you're on. That's why the Bible says we were once children of wrath. All of us were children of wrath. There are no exclusions. All of us were. We were children of wrath. We were vessels of the devil himself. And then we were saved and transformed and our works changed. And we agreed with the Father's kingdom and not with this kingdom of darkness, with the prince of the air which runs, which is king over the kings of the earth. God appoints kings, but he didn't mince words when he told us who these kingdoms belong to. People can justify them all they want. There's nothing you can do for these kingdoms in this world that will produce something holy. For every good thing that happens in these kingdoms, somebody's paying a price by the death of them. But somebody's going to die for something in there, right? So anyway, to be a vessel, that's what it is. Next question. How do we know what God hates? He mentioned it. God listed what he hates in the Bible. Do you guys know that? If we truly belong to him, we will move away and we will never do what he hates. But that's just like a tail bear. God hates a tail bear. A person who carries somebody else's story to somebody else. But the problem is a lot of God's children, they do tail bearing. They carry somebody's story to somebody else. There are things he hates that we practice. Also strongly dislike some other things that a lot of other people practice. And so on a, on a real truthful level, before anybody goes and looks at the scripture on a truthful level, all one has to do is examine in their lives what they stand against and what they refuse to do to another person. And if you write those things down, you read that scripture, you'll be surprised. You'll say, oh, I got some work to do. That means we have not totally surrendered. If we practice those things God hates, then uh, we haven't fully adopted the heart of the Father yet. We're still going through a process. How can we love a thing and love to practice the thing God hates? One of the biggest ones is tail bear, accusers. He can't stand an accuser. Lying tongue, false witness. God doesn't like those things. You know why? It just so happens that the very things he hates are the things found among his own people. Did you know that? In that list of things he hates, they're found among his own people. In fact, he talks about that in the Old Testament, that it was found among his own people. It's probably why he hates them, because it's what his own people practice. Somebody says, can you speak of the healthy fear of the Lord? What is fear of the Lord, though? Isn't fear of the Lord respect? For example, people used to fear kings. And here's what that means. You understand the authority of that king. You understand the dominion of that king. You understand what he can do and what he can't do. But you, you have respect for his position. You have respect for his word. You have all respect for him. In other words, you will lay your crown down in his power. Fear is not just run away. You're scared he might kill you. No, that's not what that word fear means. Fear is when you see the seat of an individual and you respect it above all things. To fear the Lord is to have a healthy respect of the Lord. 
That means you understand his power. You understand his rule. You understand his blessing. You understand his word and his decrees. And you absolutely accept them. And you yourselves would put your own heart, thoughts, everything aside for the sake of the one you have fear of or respect of. That is the Lord. So you'll take a second seat in, um, in a chain of command when you really have respect for your leaders, the ones appointed over you. If you thought you had the best plan in the world, you would go through it in the garbage. Why? Because the one appointed over you would give you a plan. If they present their plan, you automatically set yours lower because you respect and trust their guidance. To have that fear of the Lord is to respect and trust his guidance, to respect his decision. First of all, he made you human beings who live on earth. How many respect that? He put you in the family you're in. How many respect that? He allows your conditions to become the way they are. How many respect that? How many would lay yourselves aside that the Lord's process be complete? He sent his son to die for you that you could repent fully. How many respect that? How many would set their own agenda aside, what they think aside and everything else aside to fully receive what the king bestowed upon them, which is salvation? That's a healthy respect, not trembling in the corner of you understand his power, but by way of respect, by way of belief, by way of faith, you fear the Lord. That's a fear of the Lord. So it's just not, if, if God showed us his presence, not one of us would sin because we would be too mortified to do anything wrong. But that's not how he rules, is it? He allowed us room. We don't see him. We're not in fear of what his presence is. But by faith, we do respect him. As we learn about him, we do repent, lay down things of our own lives. When we find out he has a plan already, we throw ours in the garbage. And that's qualified in our lives as we continue to go forward. We don't know it all at once, naturally. So there are lots of times when you'll say, ah, I'm not going to do it my way. Lord, have your way. 